Hello, we're going to get started now. Hello, my name is Carlos, and uh, I'm a member of the Acton Seventh-day Adventist Church. I was privileged and honored to have worshipped and fellowshiped with Henry, and uh, he was a really great man. Um, on behalf of the Combs family, I would like to welcome you here today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all the kind thoughts, the prayers, and the comforting words. Today, we probably will have some tears um, because we feel the loss that we have. But I think we will also have smiles and we probably will have a little laughter also because we are going to remember our good friend. Today we should uh, also rejoice and be happy because we, we have the promise of God that one day we all may be together in God's heavenly kingdom with Henry. Randy? Shall we stand for prayer, please? <clears throat> God, Father, we just thank you that we could come here and honor Henry today. And we ask that your presence will be here, your Holy Spirit, that we can enjoy his life as he lived at just shy of 100 years, that we can apply the things that he learned and that we're going to learn here today to our lives to make us better people. Lord, we just thank you for Henry's life. We thank you for all the relatives and friends that are here to honor. And we thank you, Lord, that you're smiling down upon us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
It was a cold winter day, December 4, 1916. A young farm couple in Wellington, Colorado, welcomed their first child, a son. He would be one of five, three boys and two girls, and would grow up mostly in Wheatland, Wyoming. Henry Combs saw the world change. From horsepower to rocket power. In fact, he didn't ride in motor car until he was five years old. And even then, he really didn't want to get in that noisy thing. In time, he would learn to drive even a six-horse team to get farm work done. His curiosity, which would last his whole life, was insatiable. At two years old, he wanted to know what was in the coal bucket. The house was heated by a pot-bellied stove, fired by coal, so a bucket of coal was kept nearby. His mother scolded, even spanked him to keep him out of the bucket, but to no avail. He insisted he would get into that bucket. Finally, she gave up and let him have it. Over almost the next hour, he removed and examined every piece of coal in that bucket. And when he was finished, he was dirty as the coal he examined, but he knew what was in the bucket. And after that, he left it alone. His thirst for learning extended to school and beyond. He missed only one day of school during all of his years, and that was because of a blizzard that literally could be measured with the storied Wyoming wind gauge, which is a long chain suspended from an upright. When the log cabin blows sideways, you have strong wind. In his high school years, he even drove the school bus. Imagine a 16-year-old school bus driver taking your kids to school today. On June 27, Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic Ocean. Henry was greatly inspired by this. He became determined to learn to fly, and in fact, he did. He got a private pilot's license and continued to fly for over 60 years, first with powered aircraft and later soaring like an eagle on the currents of a sailplane. He studied structures and aviation in college and graduated in 1940 as an aeronautical engineer from the Curtis Wright Technical Institute in Glendale, California. He did so well that the school offered him a professorship, but Henry would rather do than teach. He started to work with Lockheed aircraft as part of the Hudson bomber projects to support the British war effort. At this time, the U.S. was more than a year away from being involved in the war. Early one morning, Henry rented a plane at Whiteman Airport in Pacoima, California. The date was December 7, 1941, and he was flying when the news shook our world that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. When he landed, fully relaxed and happy, the place looked nothing like when he took off. This was the last time he could fly until 1946. As an engineer working for Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works with Kelly Johnson, Henry was deemed too valuable to be drafted into the war. He spent his weeks designing bombers. On the weekends, he volunteered his time working side by side with the crews, bucking rivets or doing anything that needed to be done to help with our war effort. He didn't take a day off until well into 1943. During this time, gas was rationed, and he was allowed three gallons a week. This was not enough fuel for his daily needs, so Henry designed a system to burn kerosene in the gas engine of his personal vehicle. By installing a dual fuel feed system, he would start the car on gas and run until the engine was hot and then switch to kerosene. This would definitely not pass the smog tests of today, but it got him to where he needed to go. In fact, he went to visit his parents in Colorado in 1943 and used less than three gallons of gasoline to do it. He never said how many gallons of kerosene he went through on that trip, though. In 1947, he married Edna, Jimmy Caldwell. They would remain married for life, raising four children on his secluded gentleman's ranch in what is now known as Santa Clarita Valley, California. His ingenuity knew no ends, and so many designs came forth that would have lasting impacts. In fact, 
When you step on an airline today, you are in his design. He and two other engineers designed the formula for the cigar-shaped fuselage that airlines still use today. Henry was a major factor in the design of the U-2 spy plane. Rather than build something entirely new, they put long wings on an F-104 and flew higher than man had flown before. He was called the father of the titanium A-12 structure for his developing tooling that could work with titanium. This was crucial to the development of the SR-71 Blackbird. He designed the claw that picked up and retrieved down a downed Soviet submarine in 1975. In 1968, it had sunk near Hawaii. This recovery may have changed the course of nautical history. Henry was never one to tell stories of his experiences. Many of his exploits were even classified. He just wouldn't answer curious questions from people who didn't need to know. Many of his deeds, therefore, will never be fully known. He was always willing to help, in fact, after the Space Shuttle Columbia broke apart on re-entry due to some heat resistant tiles having been damaged during takeoff. Henry guided the fix for the space shuttle in the event that there was a repeat of damaged bricks on takeoff. His answer, use titanium to patch the hole, of course. This fix is known to be used at least once after a launch had resulted in similar damage to the heat, resistance, heat resistant bricks on the outside of that space shuttle. During that mission, while in orbit, astronauts bolted on the titanium patch over the damaged bricks. When that mission returned, the shuttle touched down safely. Henry's love of flying guided him to try soaring in the early 1960s. It was love at first flight. He would go on to fly cross country without a motor. He would stow in the air and then would fly like a hawk on thermals of air moving up, sometimes even sharing that thermal with the hawk. He said that soaring was like life. You have to keep it going because once you're on the ground, you're finished. He was recognized by the Soaring Society of America multiple times for his achievements. A diamond distance flight is a flight of at least 500 kilometers. During his career, he flew 208 of them. At least one of his distance records still stands. At last count, excuse me, but he never did it for recognition. He did it because he loved to fly. When he discovered information that could help others, he would publish those facts and not demand payment. May 26, 1984, he almost lost a friend when that man's sailplane crashed into a mountainside. His friend was engaged in a practice called ridge running, and at times, due to turbulent and unexpected changes in the air currents coming off the mountain, a pilot could be caught off guard when flying close to the mountain. In some cases, this would result in a sudden crash into the mountain in which nearly all pilots were killed. By interviewing this friend who survived, he was able to determine the cause of the accident and published an article in 1984, the September issue of Soaring Magazine, entitled, That Beautiful Mountain and Her Sinister Trap, a possible explanation for some unexplained ridge soaring crashes. He also determined an appropriate way to recover before crashing and included that in his publication. Later, he received a letter from a very grateful pilot who credited him with saving his life. The pilot stated he read the article and later while ridge soaring was able to recover his plane and avoid a collision with the mountainside. He was an obsessive tinkerer and neighbors knew if you brought something over for Henry to look at, quote unquote, it often got fixed, not just diagnosed. Henry loved the outdoors. It was said that whether hunting, fishing, or just sightseeing, getting there was half the fun for Henry. But due to glaucoma, he eventually had to give up flying and later driving. His son Roger took him on his last dove hunt in September 2013, and he was only able to get one dove. But that was only one dove shot at. 
that meant 100% success, and Henry saw it that way. Henry lost his beloved wife on December 28, 2013, about the same time he fully lost his sight. He always believed in God, but wasn't much for organized religion. He didn't think that sitting around a cloud forever sounded like much fun, but he had a dream where he saw the universe and how complex it was. He realized that there was more out there than just clouds and harps. And in 2015, he was baptized and looked forward to meeting his wife again in the next world. Now they both sleep in Christ, and we look forward to that day when they will wake to share the adventures of an eternity together. Good afternoon. My name is Walter Combs, Henry Combs' grandson, and uh, you'll get a few musical numbers from a few of his grandkids here today. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me At the heart's portal He's waiting and watching Watching for you and for me Come home, come home Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading? Pleading for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercy? Mercy's for you and for me. Think of the wonderful love he has promised. Promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, Come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Good afternoon. Why God chose Henry Combs to be my father-in-law? Or why God chose me to be his daughter-in-law? On April 28, 1982, 
God revealed to me on a dream. Henry Combs property, the hillside, the canyons, the surroundings of the Baker Canyon, the house and the cars, and most of all, my husband to be a Roger. It is God's providence. On May 28, 1982, it's a memorial weekend. The Combs family welcomed my arrival at their humble home. God has a great purpose. That purpose is to minister his physical and his spiritual needs. Year 2000, I took Dad Henry to the emergency at Holy Cross Hospital and ended at the intensive care unit. My prayer is to spare his life. After one week, he was released. It was a miracle of healing. After mother's passing away, dad suffered anxiety, depression, sad, loneliness. I rushed him to the hospital again at the Holy Cross. And I prayed for interceding to spare his life again. And God answers prayer, and he was released. We visited different eye specialists. Unfortunately, no recovery. Doctor's prescription, prescription is to maintain eye drops day and night. He was totally blind. While sitting on a patio one morning, he asked me a question. Becky, do you think mother is watching us right now? She's in heaven. And my answer, what makes you think about it, Dad? Well, I heard when a person die, he or she will go direct to heaven. My response, it's not biblical. Dad, if mother is in heaven now, do you think she's happy watching you going back and forth to the emergency? She will not be happy. I invite you to have a Bible study with me. And we will let the Bible answer all your questions. The Bible is holy, and it's the Word of God. Well, I have so many questions that you need to answer. Okay, let's have a Bible study. Now, I would like to share this with you because this is, this is his memory. And these questions are most your questions that we need and answers. Question, does God really love me or really curse about me, Becky? Well, in Isaiah 43, 4, it says, Since you were precious in my sight, you had been honored, and I have loved you. And in Jeremiah 31, 3, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. The answer to that, Dad, is that God's never-ending love for you and for me is far beyond our understanding. He loves you as though you are the only soul in the universe. He would has, he would has given his life for you or me, even if there had been no other sinner to redeem. You're precious in his sight. Oh, that was a relief. Now, another question. How do I receive him and pass death to life? Well, three things. One is that you and I are sinner. It says in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short to the glory of God. And the number two is that you and I are doomed to die. In Romans 16 to 23, the wages of sin is death. And number three is that you and I cannot say by ourselves. John 15, 5, without me, you cannot do anything. But you have to believe three things. And what are, what are those three things? The number one is that Jesus died for you and for me. Hebrews 2, 9. Number two is that Jesus forgives you and me. 1 John 1, 9. And number three is that Jesus saves you and me. John 6, 47. I have another question. What must I do in order to obtain this gift of salvation? Well, Romans 3, 23, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And Romans 3, 28, a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. The answer to that, Dad, is that you can do is to accept it. As a pure gift, my words of obedience will not help me one bit in the justification of experience. All who ask for salvation in faith will receive it. 
Remember, God loves everyone alike, and forgiveness is for the taking. Another question, Vicky, what happens when I die tonight? Well, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, then the dust will return to the earth, and is it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. The answer to that question is that the body turns to dust again, and the spirit goes back to God who gave it. The spirit of every person who dies, whether righteous or wicked, returns to God at death. Well, my another question, this is very getting interested. Is my spirit returned to God at death? Well, James 2, 26, the body without the spirit is dead. John 27, 3, the spirit of God is in my nostril. The answer to that question is that the spirit that returns to God at death is the breath of life. Nowhere in all God's book does the spirit have any life, wisdom, or feeling after a person dies. It is the breath of life and nothing more. Now, how about my soul? What is a soul and do souls die? Genesis 2-7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breath into his nostrils, the breath of life, and a man became a living soul. The answer is, his soul is a living being. His soul is always a combination of two things, body plus breath. A soul cannot exist unless body and breath are combined. God's word teaches us we are souls. Well, if I'm good, do good people go to heaven? John 5, 28, 29, all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Acts 2, 29, 34, David, which is King David, is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. For David did not ascend into heaven. And John 17, 13, if I with the grave is mine house. The answer is no. No, people do not go either to heaven or hell at death. They go to their graves to await resurrection day. Another question, how much I know or comprehend after I die? Ecclesiastes 9, 5, 6, 10. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward for the mem memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have shown in anything done under the sun. There is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going, Dad. Psalms 115:17. that they do not praise the Lord. The answer to that question is that God says that the dead know absolutely nothing. Well, can't the dead communicate with the living? Can I communicate with mother right now? Well, the answer to that question is Ecclesiastes 9, 6, never will they have share in anything done under the sun. John 14, 12, 21, so man lies down and does not rise. Tell the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be aroused from their sleep. His sons come to honor and he does not know it. They are brought low and he does not perceive it. The answer is no. The dead cannot contact the living. You cannot contact mother. Nor do they know what the living are doing. They're dead. Their thoughts have perished. Now, this question is kind of intense questions, and I would like to share this with you. Please don't leave me. On what day did Jesus customarily, customarily worship Becky? Luke 4, 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and his custom was on. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The answer is Jesus. Custom was to worship on the Sabbath. And who made the Sabbath and when? He's a very intelligent man. He really wants to know the answers. Okay, Genesis 1, 1, 2, 2 and 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And on seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. The answer to that question, God made the Sabbath at the time of creation. When he made the world, he rested on the Sabbath and blessed and sanctified it. That means it's set apart for a holy use. Well, 
what does God say about Sabbath keeping in the Ten Commandments which he wrote in his own finger? Exodus 28, 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and dole your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it you shall do no work, nor you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your maidservant, nor your female servant, nor your cow, nor your stranger who is within you, within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. In Deuteronomy 19, then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with his own finger. The answer to that question, Dad, is that in the fourth commandments of the ten, God commands us to observe the seventh day as his holy day. God knew people would forget his Sabbath, so he began, so he began this commandment with the word remember. He has never commanded anyone, anywhere, to keep any other day as a weekly holiday. Well, who changed the Sabbath anyway? Does the papacy claim that it has power to change the law of God and in particular the right to change the Sabbath? Which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do you observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because of the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, AD 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Reverend Peter Gehrman, CSSR, The Converts, Catechism, The Catholic Doctrine, page 50, second edition, 1910. Now, my mother, on my mother's side, are Catholic. I love the Catholic, and I love all of you. It's not talking about the people here, it's talking about the system. There's gonna be a lot of Catholic in heaven and our different denomination. On May 25 of 2015, Dad accepted Jesus as his own personal savior through baptism by immersion. He was 98 years old. The Holy Spirit is working in his life. He's loving. His joy, he had peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, his courteous, gentle father-in-law. As a caregiver for two and a half years, I learned to be obedient. God purified my defects of my character. Putting him to bed like a small baby, tucking inside the blanket with prayer, and say, good night, Dad, I love you. Becky, thank you so much for taking care of me. I love you too. Why you're so nice and good to me, Becky? Why you're doing it? How can I repay you? I never answered that for two, uh, two years and three months. Just two months ago, I finally answered to him. I said, Dad, you asked me that question again. I'm not doing this for you, Dad. I'm doing it for Jesus because I love Jesus so much. I want to please him. He died on the cross of Calvary. The blood that sheds on the cross of Calvary, he gave you his life. He loves you so much that we can have he loves you and me that we can have an eternal life. Becky, I'm ready to die. If I die tonight, the first thing when I woke up, I saw Jesus face to face with Christ my Savior. I'm ready to. Dad was a great mentor, a viewer for an inspiration in any aviation career. In the Soaring community, you will miss him greatly, but at the same time, cherish the great memories. I would like to sing with you the song that I sing to him before he died. Please forgive me if
My name is Travis Combs. I'm the youngest son of Stephen Combs, who is the youngest son of Henry Combs. Many of you probably don't know that 73 years ago, well, actually, put it this way, my grandpa was born on my birthday. <laughs> About 73 years prior, um, I was also born on December 4th, it was just a freak accident, but I always thought it was kind of cool. I shared a birthday with somebody I was actually related to. So, and there were times where I'd call him up on December 4th and ask him, how old are you, Grandpa? <laughs> didn't want to talk about it. He didn't like being old. Unfortunately, I can't ever do that again. Um, this birthday will have forever be different, but hope to see him on the other side someday. The last time I saw him was about a week before he passed away. Um, I had driven out there by myself just because I knew this is it. And sure enough, that was the last time I got to see him. He's kind of an interesting guy. He was more worried about me getting to my doctor's appointment than talking about whatever else. I had accidentally cut my fingernail off with a drill. So it's all healed up now. Anyways, I'm going to play some, one of his favorite hymns, Sweet By and By, and put a few others with it. I never really stick to a rigid schedule like the bulletin says. 
So pipes have been sitting for a little while, so forgive me if I'm a little out of tune. He wouldn't have known anyways. Um, some of you might know that he was tone deaf. Um, you ever hear the old adage, can't hold a tune in a bucket? My grandpa couldn't hold one in a 50-gallon drum if his life depended on it. <laughs> so he wouldn't notice. But the cool thing is every time he heard it, it was completely new. Because he had never heard it before. For those of you who don't know, the bagpipe is a very unhappy instrument. So this is my other bagpipe. I played this at my grandmother's memorial. 
At the time, I had just had tooth surgery. They capped my front tooth, and I wasn't allowed to play the big ones for a total of 10 months. So this was my everyday instrument for almost a year. So needless to say, I got very good with it very quickly. Now, as I said before, my grandfather didn't really care for music for the most of his life. But in the last few years, he started to change. Um, I noticed the change probably, oh, just off the top of my head, about six years ago. We had come home from church with my grandma, visiting or whatever, just decided, hey, let's go out to grandparents for the afternoon. And we come in the door, and he's watching 3ABN, and there's always some music program on. I thought that was kind of funny. It's like, okay, he's just doing it because he knows he should. But once my grandma passed away, I noticed that he actually began to like music. I don't know if he ever got over being tone deaf, but he understood the words. And hymns are very powerful in that respect. So he also liked anything that made his wife Edna happy. And one of her favorite hymns was Danny Boy. So me and my sister are going to do a duet. This is my sister, Tammy Combs. Um, she is my, the next sibling up. I got two other brothers. Um, so closest to age, have my sister, and that's it. She's only four years older than me, and then Brandon is 10 years older, and Devin's 12 years older. So. Anyways, this is a much quieter instrument. You can actually hear yourself over it. So without further delay, we're going to do Danny Boy. Lying 
and kneel and say a prayer there for me. Oh, I'll not hear those soft you tread above me. For oh my grave will dark and silent be. And you will bound and tell me that you love me. But I shall sleep in peace till Jesus come for me. Slowly and pipes still call and echo across the glen. Your broken family says I feel so lonely, for you have not returned to smile again So if you've tired and crossed the stream before us We pray that angels hold unto your soul And God look down and gently will implore us to live so we may see your smiling face once more. Amen. Good afternoon. My name is Devin Combs. I am uh, the oldest brother of Tammy and Travis, and uh, we also have one brother who's not with us. He's joining us online from Kansas, Brandon. And um, well, first of all, I think my sister and my brother did a really good job. <laughs> I'm very proud of them. Um, I was always very fond of, of both my grandparents, um, Henry and Edna. I always called them grandma and grandpa. And unfortunately, I was not able to make it for my grandmother's funeral when she died. Um, but I was gratified to hear that, that uh, when, when she did die, she died in, in the faith of Christ, because I would like to be in heaven with her. And I was very gratified when, when my parents 
told me that my grandfather was going to be baptized and sent me the, the pictures and the, uh, the news release and everything. Because we, at that time we knew he didn't have much longer and I, I, I didn't want him to be lost as well. And um, I, heard, I heard about how, how, what his final moments were. I was not there with him, but, but I knew uh, much of his family was with him and he, he died in the faith of Christ as well. And I look forward to seeing him in heaven because I, I do want to spend forever with him. And forever is a long, long time. We might have a problem here. The iPad? Yeah. It's, uh, it's in the case. Excuse me. Here's what we'll do, folks. We're going to have the song that the technical people work on. We'll take some remembrances at this point in time, and then after they work the, when we finish our remembrances, then we'll pick the, the audio guys and pick up the song, all right? So at this point in time, um, we're going to do actually two things. Uh, we're going to ask if you'd like to share a remembrance um, for just a minute. We have uh, about 200 people here That'll be about 200 minutes. You'll also have time um, if you'd like to share following the service uh, with the immediate family. So when you come forward, just state your name, your relationship with Henry, and share the salient piece. As that is going on, I'm going to ask our technical, uh, our tech guys in the booth, if you will start the video piece so that can be concurrently running. Um, you can watch that. They'll let that run in a, in a loop through now until the end of the service. So they'll start that momentarily. So there's a mic right here. Just come forward. Stand behind the mic. Who'd like to be... Don't everybody get up at once. We need two people to stand up and come forward. And then everybody else will feel comfortable. My name is Jeff Lay. A lot of you know me. I've met most of you at previous times. I just wanted to share that it was very exciting to know um, Henry. He started coming to church about the time, um, about four years ago, five years ago. It's been a while up in the Acton Church. And each time we spent time to talk, it was always interesting. There was always something to talk about. And sometimes we had a hard time communicating because of his low voice, but it was just fun. And when he's talking about someone who's been and seen and done so much, it was, I don't know, a joy, a real joy. And when he took time for give his heart to Christ, that was, 
Fantastic. I'm Stephen Combs, the youngest son of Henry Combs, and I want to tell you a moment about some Combs boys about a hundred years ago. Now John, the younger, I'm not sure what he did when he was very young, but it's told to me that when he was a little older, he spent some time in a hospital, and he was in the bed, and the nurse came by and said, I'd like you to leave us a urine sample, and she left a cup on the table. She went away and the wheels started turning. He had a little pitcher of apple juice. <laughs> You're getting ahead of me here. When she poured into the cup and just set it aside and went back to his paper. Presently, the nurse came by and said, ha, ah, thank you, and oh, it's very clear. He said, oh, you're not satisfied? Give it back, we'll run it through again. And he chugged it. Now, it is believed that with sufficient counseling, she did recover. <laughs> but then the next brother, the middle brother, Alec, now, eventually, he became a pharmacist. He's very good with chemicals and things. And when he was in high school, there was this substance that he created that he sprinkled on the restroom floor. When it's wet, it's perfectly fine. When it's dry, it's unstable. And when the students came walking into the restroom, it started going off like firecrackers everywhere they, they went. And so he was under suspicion one time when, see, he was also a hunter. And some hunters use a little flask of skunk perfume to mask their scent so when the coyote comes downwind of them to check out what their, their sound they're calling to see if it's a human, he can't smell them. Well, he brought this to school one night during the, um, during the weekend, and he opened up the, the, the ventilation system in the administration building. He put it up in there and opened up the lid and closed the vent and went home. Well, Monday morning, the principal called for Alec Combs by name. And he says, now, Alec, I know you had something to do with this. I just can't quite prove it. And Alec just sat there with that, we, we all knew that look he could give that, that, who, me? How could you say such a thing? Well then, we come to Henry. Now, what I have here is known as a Ford coil. This thing runs the spark plugs in a Model A. Um, it inside is, is a coil and a condenser that you might find on a later car, and up on top, a little buzzer that, that forms the points. Now, if a student like Henry were to hook this up to a, a, um, a pack of flashlight batteries and a little switch and a couple of wires, he could sneak up behind a girl at school and punch the button and light her up. And then what he says is that you know if she's a good girl or a bad girl based upon the language that she emits after such an experience. But we all know whether or not she's being tested by a good boy or a bad boy, right? So if you find yourself related to somehow or very good friends with a Combs boy and you find that he's a problem, I think maybe it's hereditary. <laughs> Okay, so the first form of media didn't work. We're going to try this again.
I can't comprehend forever Eternities beyond my human mind They tell me heaven is forever And forever is a long, long time The sun will rise to never set again Troubles of this world are far behind Time is just a thing called the long-forgotten past Nothing there can bother my mind Everywhere are happy, happy people Listening to the bells and how they chime Heaven's golden day will last forever And forever is a long, long time gift of God is life eternal. Seek this gift and you will find peace and joy forever. And forever is a long, long time. The sun will rise to never set again. Troubles of this world are far behind. Time is just a thing called the long-forgotten past Nothing there can bother my mind Everywhere are happy, happy people Listening to the bells and how they chime Heaven's golden day will last forever And forever is a long, long time Heaven's golden day will last forever, and forever is a long, long Would there be any other family members that'd like to share a tribute at this time? I'm a little short for this mic stand, but if I move it. So, I didn't really know my grandpa too well. He was very secretive person, didn't talk a whole lot. Um, he was rather quiet and reserved, just kind of kept to himself. Um, you, know, you could be telling him, you know, I'm going to go do such and so outside. He'd be standing there with his hands in his pockets, with his thumbs sticking out, and his cowboy hat going, well, all right then. <laughs> and he'd move like that, and he'd smile at you. He's just a funny character. Um, me and my siblings always quiz us on math problems, make sure we're smart. Um, we were all homeschooled and he wasn't quite sure about that. By the time I came around, he had dealt with it. He didn't really accept it. I'm like, okay, yeah, he's smart too. So, and he had never really minded that I play the bagpipes, even though I didn't care for music too much. He thought it was kind of interesting. Um, but I'll miss being able to talk to him about silly things like that. Um, I don't know, it's hard to recall too many of what he would come and talk about. You know, he'd sometimes ask me, well, are you having any problems yet? Like, I mean problems. Girls? No. Thinking to myself, if I did, I wouldn't want to talk to you about it. <laughs> so, anyways, 
The last time I saw him, about a week before he passed, I shook his hand and told him, I'll see you again. I don't know if he knew what I meant, but I knew I didn't think he'd live the next two days. What I meant was, I'll see you on the other side, because I want to go to heaven, and he's going to go to heaven. Pretty doggone sure about that. And all of you who are going to heaven, if you want to see the greatest visual gag ever, make sure you're there with me when he comes up behind his wife, Edna, and taps her on the shoulder and goes, boo. <laughs> She'll fall over backwards, like, what are you doing here? And then smack him for waiting until 98 years old to get baptized. <laughs> Anyways. Hi. I'm Debbie. I'm Stephen's wife. These are my children. This is for my son, Brandon. He's in uh, Kansas right now. And... Um, when he was younger, I had put them on homeschool because we had some problems in the neighborhood and whatnot. And um, I didn't care for some of the things teachers were teaching. So I thought it would be better, and I prayed a lot about it. It gave me a migraine for three days, trying to figure out if this was the right thing or not. I'm glad I did. It was the most rewarding thing for the children and for myself. But it was, um, like my son said, Grandpa was not very happy with the children being on homeschool. He didn't think I was that good of a teacher, and I wasn't a teacher <laughs> at the time. But anyways, um, he asked Brandon a question about math. Now, math and I don't get along. <laughs> I'm lucky if I can add two and two. Uh, my husband is very good at math. The kids are good at math, not me. So he always took care of the math end. And uh, he asked me, he said, so Debbie, if you have the children on homeschool, who's going to teach them math? And he knew I wasn't good in math, and I just looked at him and I said, well, Stephen will take care of that. And he says, when he comes home from work, you think he's going to have time? And I said, well, he seems to be doing fine already, so I think, yeah, he'll be fine with teaching the children. And he was, and everything worked out. But he asked Brandon a question about math, and Brandon gave him a very obscure answer. I do not remember the, the problem but it was something on an algebraic uh, level. Brandon was about, about 12 years old. I had put him on homeschool when he was in the third grade at nine. And um, he gave Grandpa a, an answer. And Grandpa looked at him and he says, well, that's wrong, just like that. And uh, Brandon said, oh, well, maybe I should think about it a little longer then. Well, we ended up leaving that evening. The next day, Henry called said he wanted to talk to Brandon. He gets Brandon on the phone, and he said, you know, I was wrong. That answer was right. You just gave it to me in a different way. And he said, I had to think about it for a while, and I realized you are getting taught very well. So, Brandon, this was for you, because you're not here, I wouldn't be able to tell that story. Well, since we're telling math stories, um, let's see. Uh, when I was a child, too, he, uh, he, he had a big hand in raising me and uh, made sure that I knew arithmetic and uh, subtraction. And I can still remember he would take peanuts. Peanuts were rewards for grandchildren and dogs. One, two, three. And the dog would catch it. Well, um, he would uh, he'd pour out a bunch of peanuts. He'd say, uh, how many peanuts we got there? <laughs> well, we've got 15 peanuts. How many peanuts are there? And I, <laughs> um, nine peanuts, okay. How many peanuts did I take? Six, good, <laughs> you know, and then we'd play that back and forth, back and forth game. And uh, so that was always fun. And, over the years, I've enjoyed lots of stories that I've heard of Grandpa, and uh, some of them are straight hero stories of uh, when the, everybody, even my parents and his siblings were young. Grandpa uh, 
saved kids or dogs or something from some coyote that got too close by grabbing it by the tail. There you go. My grandpa was tough. <laughs> and, uh, but no matter what, even if he told a story, he'd tell it quietly. And the picture we've tried to put on the uh, bulletin in the program was just a quiet picture on, of his quiet smile. And uh, I, a story that really stuck out to me was uh, when he worked at Lockheed, people would, the story goes, people would be around and they'd be talking out an idea or something. And they'd all be going back and forth discussing it. And somebody would notice Grandpa with his quiet smile. And the person said, we all knew Henry was about to make us look stupid. <laughs> there is a humorous story that my mother used to love to tell about him. <clears throat> they lived in Sunland in the back of an old converted theater there they had an apartment. the bread box and he slid the bread box carefully open and inside was a black rat with a few white spots have any of you ever seen a spotted skunk <laughs> neither had he <laughs> my mother said he just wanted to try out his new 22 rifle anyway and he decided that that had to go, so he got the 22 rifle and shot it. Shooting a skunk in the kitchen. <laughs> he grabbed the dish towel, threw it around the skunk, took it outside, buried it, towel and all. <clears throat> all the food that wasn't canned had to be thrown out. That got into everything, and the house had to be painted. Thank goodness they still had the lead-based paint back there in, in order to get rid of the smell. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but I said, that story saved me a lot of trouble once when I was in Kansas because I came across the spotted skunk. And I said, I knew what it was. <laughs> Yeah, my name is Bob Blackstock. I crewed for Henry uh, several times. Well, I say several times, probably six does, six times, maybe a half, uh, eight or nine times. My wife is back there. Uh, she and I uh, crewed for him, and it was always a great experience uh, crewing for Henry on his, uh, his glider outings. And uh, of course, we tried to we lived down in Thousand Oaks, and it was about an hour and a half drive to get up to his house. But once we got there, it was a, a nice. Uh, discussion about uh, the various details of his vehicle and, and uh, the checklist he had for us is uh, being, being on the ground and, and uh, chasing him uh, throughout the desert. And uh, all those trips are always a lot of fun, especially on the trip back, uh, because uh, uh, he always uh, wanted to, to do something on the side. Uh, one of the things we did was hike down uh, Fossil Falls, uh, which is uh, north of here, uh, up in the um, uh, valley, uh, the uh, Owens Valley. Uh, another trip was uh, uh, coming back uh, through uh, Lone Pine. Uh, we spent the night there, and uh, the next day he wanted to go um, trout fishing uh, up in the, the mountains uh, to uh, Whitney Portal. And uh, within sight, so like it was less than an hour, he had his entire catch um, of uh, whatever the limit happened to be for those uh, the trout there uh, in the streams. But uh, one story in particular, and Lisa and I were talking about that uh, just uh, a few minutes ago. Yeah, uh, this uh, he landed at. Uh, I, as I recall it, it was uh, Lovelock in, in Lovelock, Nevada. Uh, she recalls it as uh, as Fallon, Nevada. It doesn't make any difference. But anyway, the next next morning uh, we uh, had breakfast at the local restaurant, and uh, as we were walking out, one of the locals said to, to Henry, "Is and, and do I know you?" And Henry said, "I don't think so. I'm from down in Los Angeles area." Well, and the guy said, "Well, you really look like a friend of mine." And Henry uh, retorted, without losing a beat at all, he said, uh, well, I feel really sorry for the fella. <laughs> <laughs>
So to me, that was Henry Combs. He was always had a, such a nice, uh, quick, quick wit, and he was a great guy to be around. I, I will truly, truly miss him. He was a, a fun guy. So thank you. Um, I'd always known my, uh, my grandfather had, uh, had done quite a bit in, um, with, with, with airplanes. Um, all the time I was growing up, my, my parents told me that he, that he uh, worked, uh, worked very closely with the founders of Lockheed, um, principally working with the, with the SR-71 and the U-2 spy plane. And for me, growing up as a patriotic American, um, I always, always felt proud to, to be able to call my grandfather as one of those who defended, his, who defended our country in his own way. And he, they, they would also tell me about, about uh, his, uh, his sailplane activities and how he had a, a, an actual award named after him. I was actually able to, to see a replica of the award um, in a museum I, I, I toured some time ago. Um, every so often when I go to an aeronautical museum, quite often I'll see a picture of him somewhere. And a few, uh, several years ago, my parents gave me a book for Christmas uh, titled The Skunk Works. You can still find it on Amazon, I believe. It was authored by Ben Rich. Ben Rich worked very closely with Kelly Johnson in Lockheed Skunk Works. And my grandfather was also mentioned at least a couple times in that book. So it was very gratifying to, to, to me to, to actually you know, read about some of the things that my grandfather was involved with. And I am going to miss him uh, very much. I'm going to miss him very much. But I, I'm, I'm proud to know that he was my grandfather. Well, again, my name is Tammy, and I am a figure skater. I still work and train. I do coach little ones, and I do spend most of my time in the free air conditioning. Thank heaven. Uh, I didn't know why I became a figure skater, except I really wanted the opportunity to fly. We don't have that here on Earth. So that was the first thing that I could figure out I could do, and God allowed me to do that. And I found out at my first competition that my grandparents were both figure skaters. They didn't speak much about it. I learned a few things. They were pretty quiet about their young times, but my grandmother, apparently Jimmy, she, I had inherited her ability to tap dance and not fall, <laughs> or maybe it was Irish step. <laughs> so I, um, Grandpa was an accomplished ice dancer, and for those of you do, who don't understand ice skating, ice dance is like ballroom, but way more difficult, and the music is very boring. And now I understand why he was okay with that. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was about the steps, and uh, he would come to watch me skate sometimes, and he would try to explain the physics of why something worked and the mathematics, and he would start saying the numbers. And the thing is, figure skaters can either be very, very smart and intelligent and book smart, and they'll be surgeons and lawyers, but then you have your artists. And I'm just the one person in the family who just doesn't get math. <laughs> OK, Travis, too. <laughs> so uh, one time I was competing, apparently at one of the at one of the ballrooms, the ballroom ice rinks that they used to skate in. And I didn't find that out until after I had competed. And it was one of the few times I actually fell. Now, now I'll, do, I'll do some flub ups, but actually fall on my bum, that doesn't happen too often, you know? So grandma comes up and goes, oh, I would have just tap danced my way through. <laughs> and grandpa goes, do you get hot when you perform? 
And I say, oh, sometimes, sometimes. My, my sleeves are long today, it's a little warm. He goes, I figured you needed to cool off. I saw you took the bottom approach. <laughs> Thanks, Grandpa. Um, in music, you have your Frank Sinatra, your Dean Martin, all your classic greats everyone's pretty familiar with. In figure skating, we have comparable artists as well, and they're still alive, they're still skating around, and sometimes they remember me by name, sometimes they're not sure why they know me, sometimes they have a small story about grandma and grandpa, but I don't really mind if I get one or not, it's just nice to kind of know them. And um, grandpa was one of, one of them. He, he did his shows, he didn't go on tour, he didn't leave his work, he was very dedicated to his work, but he did go on local tours, he did skate, and he did, um, one time he showed me a program, a very, very old program, The Princess Birthday, and he goes, there's my name, right there, and there's that old stinker, and there's that booger. <laughs> So there, there was, there's a whole lot more. I'll probably find out more as I progress and as I hang out with his old friends. But there's that. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak. I, I'm Marshall. Holmes, it's so good to hear that name pronounced correctly in a place like this. So many people know how to spell it properly and know how to pronounce it. It's a great thing to hear that name. Combs, there's a certain ring to it. My wife Josie is uh, with me today. I'm a cousin of Henry's. We live in West Covina, California. We didn't really get to see them as often as we should have, but they came over, over to our place a couple times and we came out to the ranch a time or two and always enjoyed the opportunities we had to get together with them. What a wonderful couple. And they just, uh, I'm so happy that I could be here today and, and see some of the uh, uh, family members that I haven't seen for a long time. We had a few reunions over the years, but not enough and your faces change and perhaps my face changes a little but uh, my dad was a younger brother of Asa Combs who was Henry's brother now I'm 79 and I was the young guy because of course Henry was 99 and uh, all these family relationships are just so wonderful. We're glad to be here, and I hope I'll have a chance to talk with some of you later. And again, I thank you for giving us the time to say these things. I just wanted to share a quotation with you. Robert Browning, who wrote that beautiful poem, and Robert Browning said, Grow old along with me. The best is yet to be. The last of life for which the first was made. I, I, I know that Henry was a believer for a long, long time, but I am so grateful that you had an influence, Becky, in helping him to come to a fuller faith and to express it, how wonderful. And then to think about our future and to think that we all can just kind of grow old together. I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, what wonderful things God has prepared for those who love him. Thank you. I am Charity Combs. I'm actually the oldest daughter of Larry Combs, raised by Roger and Becky Combs on Grandpa and Grandma Combs' ranch. 
This is Colt Henry Wiederman. You can tell that I have, um, my grandpa had a little bit of an influence on me. He decided that he wants to talk a little bit about grandpa. Can you talk about grandpa? g -pa. Hey guys. <laughs> me and Grandpa Combs had lots of fun together when uh, Grandpa was alive. I'm part of the Wiederman family and the Combs family because my last name is Wiederman. And we have Marcus Wiederman. He's my dad, and, well, me and my dad have lots of fun to th together. Thank you. I'm actually really glad that my son got to meet my grandparents before they moved on. Um, I actually came to live with my... Um, parents and my grandparents when I was six, five or six, something like that. Um, and I remember watching Grandpa load up his sailplane and, Grandma, Mom, Dad, where, where is Grandpa going? Oh, he's going to go flying. I want to go. Why can't I go? You'll be bored. But I want to go. I never, never did get to go with him. Um, in retrospect, I don't blame him. Having a six or seven year old in a trip for a couple days, what were we saying, a couple few days, just driving around um, pre-electronics, um, little cell phones that keep them interested for several hours on the road. No, we didn't have that. So I, I don't blame him at all for not wanting to take me. Um, but he did have a lot of influence on my career choices um, and inspirations. Um, I do have a master's degree in aeronautical science and a private helicopter certificate. They don't issue licenses. They're actually certificates. Um, when I decided to go get my certificate, I was talking to my grandpa about it, and um, there's a program that was really awesome that I could get into, and, you know, it was, but it was helicopters. Grandpa, you do realize that those are inherently unstable. He was not very for me getting my helicopter certificate. Um, he did end up supporting me in the endeavor, and, um, and I can actually relate also to Dev or Brandon's story, taking calculus in high school, trying to get Grandpa to help me. But it had to be Grandpa's way. But no, Grandpa, it's the teacher's way. It didn't work very well. We were both way too headstrong for that. And that's probably the reason I won't be able to finish homeschooling this one, because he is just as headstrong. So, um, I am seven years old. I just wanted you guys to know. And I was born in 2009. <laughs> I didn't want to talk, but somebody has to represent the soaring community, and you are really looking at one of the uh, poorest sailplane pilots that ever was. Uh, one day, I decided I wanted to set a world altitude record that had been standing for 20 years. I had a glider, I wasn't doing anything with it. And so I set upon that goal and I met Henry. The thing about Henry was that he dispensed information so generously. By the way, uh, his nickname amongst a group that I'm sitting with is called Humble Henry. Uh, there was a group 
after I had been in my project for a while, that came on uh, to the airport with a very fancy glider with full pressure suits, called themselves Flight Level 500, which means 50,000 feet. These guys are going to go to 50,000 feet. And I thought, okay, well, that's pretty good. Uh, I was thinking about going something like that. Henry one day said, Bob, around California City, we're not allowed to go above 18,000 feet, so why don't you just call yourself flight level 179.999? <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, that's a good idea. A friend of mine that I'm sitting with right now made a logo for me, flight level 179.999. Because of Henry, I went to 49,000 feet and got down safely. Without Henry's input, I would have never begun the altitude project. Um, again, I had to reduce all the facets of the project to its simplest form, and that's the only way that I could understand it, but Henry would always come around and give me a little bit more information, say, Bob, you gotta have this, and Bob, you gotta have that, and finally one day I said, Henry, if I put all the stuff in the sailplane that you want me to put, it'll never get off the ground. He says, well, you gotta do it. The one transmission that I'll never forget was when I got my triple Lenny pin, I took a sailplane up to 40, over 40,000 feet, and I wanted I called Henry. Henry was my ground. And I said, Henry, I want two martinis when I get in. Thank you very much. My name is Pastor Rick Rothler. And we'll have one more. Hi, my name is Philippe Atuil. I, I have known uh, Henry when I just started flying gliders, and uh, it was his last cross-country season, and it was my very first cross-country cro cross country season. So I'm from France. You may actually hear my, my, my accent. So when I looked at Henry, I, it seemed to me I was in a movie. He says like this hat and um, always never, talk, never talking much. And... Um, on my third cross-country flight, um, we ended up miraculously uh, to a small airport called Inyokern. And I had decided to actually land at Inyokern, where he had just landed, uh, because not because I could not really go um, any further, because I wanted to actually go back to Crystal, but because I had to urinate very, very badly. <laughs> And I, such, I had all the equipment to urinate in the glider, but I was so, I was bungling the thing so badly that I had everything wrong. And I decided, okay, I'm going to land where Henry landed. And basically, I landed avoiding a full crash, and I exploded out of the cockpit and almost urinated straight on the, on the runway. And Henry's looking at me like, you know, there are toilets for this. <laughs> uh, so basically, after that, he said, I have to talk to you about etiquette. <laughs> which, uh, which I understood. Three years later, I was uh, graced to have uh, actually uh, gotten my name on his uh, trophy. So. I've known Henry since the year 2000. I found Henry to be a deep thinker and a man of few words many times, and I shall follow his pattern as we conclude our service together. I'd like to find out just rather quickly, if you're, if you're connected with Henry through flying and soaring and work, if you just stand up, stand up. Let's give him a hand.
If you're connected with, Ham, uh, with Henry and the Combs family through uh, kind of the Acton Church or community surrounding Acton, stand up. All right. Thank you for coming. And those that know him from the Santa Clarita Church and surrounding Santa Clarita area, please stand. Oh, we have, we have a few. It seems that 1916 was a very good year, wasn't it? Yes. After all, that's the year that Henry was born. I lived for about a dozen years, 44.6 miles, according to Google, uh, from where Henry was born. Now, if you haven't had the privilege of being in Colorado, if you go up uh, Interstate 25, his birthplace, Willington, is just off 25. At that time, it was a small community of about 500 people. One of the great things about living in Colorado in 1960, it was a windswept anything east of anything seven miles west of I-25 to Iowa, uh, Nebraska and Iowa is just wide open plains. So you can be 100 feet up in the mountains and you can see Iowa, almost. One of the great things, though, is the ability to climb the peaks and watch the eagles soar and the hawks soar. And I can just imagine Henry doing that as a child, looking towards the heavens. It's amazing how God creates us in his image. And when I think of Henry, Henry and my interna interactions with him, I find a person who explored the things that God had made and thought and expanded his horizons, who engaged in the world and later on became very serious of what eternity was all about. His imagination just propelled him in so many different areas. It's already been shared. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that, has a, that is at work within us. We think imagination is something of our own creation. But we just begin to scratch the surface of God's imagination. And so behind that quiet face was Henry's thinking and imagining not what is, but what could be. Corinthians says, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So Henry could often look beyond the obvious to see the inferences of God's handiwork in creation. We see in two or three dimensions. Is it possible that God might have four, five, or six, or seven ways of creating the universe. I can't wait, friends, to be there with him. As God says, Henry, come forth. I got a few things you might be interested in. Let's take a walk. Better yet, let's just get there in thought speed. And we're there. And we move about multiple dimensions at the same time. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that loved him. The second thing that I remember about Henry is his, his love for soaring. I have only one regret, that I didn't get to meet him, again, did not get to know him much better early in the time that I knew him. 
because 20,000 feet is a place to be when there is no engine. Because when you're up there, it's real quiet. And it's only you soaring above the eagles and the hawks and looking out at the vast earth that God created and having quiet time with him. And I have to say, while you're still in quiet, you're reading the slopes, you're reading the topography, you're watching for the wind, and you're feeling the glider gliding through air. I wonder what it's going to be like traveling across the universe without a plane, just gliding from one planet to another that God has created. Henry, how you doing over there? Let's spend a couple of light years journeying to this place. I have not seen the things that God has created. Isaiah chapter 40, when I think of soaring, Isaiah chapter 40 comes to my mind, verses 30 and 31, uh, 28 through 31. It says, Do you know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable, inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks, he increases power. Though youth grow, youth grow weary and tired, the vigorous young man may stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord, he will gain strength. They will mount up with the wings of eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not be weary. Can't wait for that day. How about you, friend? As Henry's body grew tired, and as physical strength wore out, I am sure as I visited him at Henry Mayo, and as I visited in his home, he couldn't wait until he had the strength to go soaring once again with God and his friends in the soaring community. He was looking forward to that day. Becky called me a few Sabbaths ago and said Henry wasn't doing very well. After church, I stopped by. His breathing was a bit, his breathing was labored and somewhat irregular, indicating that his life force was being depleted and the end was probably very near. Unable to, be, unable to respond, but knowing full well that many times hearing is the last thing that goes with, uh, with a person who is not able to respond. I shared with him the passage from John chapter 14 because I believe Henry had peace in his soul. I shared the peace and the place and the promise that comes out of John 14. John 14 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you might be also. And whether I go in the way, you know. But Thomas said, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know that way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to me but by the Father. 
but by me. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Henry knew Jesus. Henry knew the place that Jesus had prepared for him. Henry found the peace of heart and peace in his life, just as he found in soaring to thinking about being one day with Jesus and one day with Edna. I shared John 14, 27, and I share it with you with the hopes that, will, that it will echo in your hearts and in your lives. For John 14, 7 says, Peace, I leave with you. My peace I give you, not as the world give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In those days and in those hours, when there's a bit of pain, when there's a bit of sorrow in your heart, think of Henry, the expansive life that he's lived. Think of Henry, the imagination that captivated his life. Think of Henry, the peace that he made with Jesus. Think of Henry when one day Jesus will call him forth. Think of him soaring here. Think of him soaring then. And think of the place that Jesus has prepared for him and has prepared for you, friend. Let not your heart be troubled. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, that where I am, there you may be also. And that is the peace that Henry found. I left. I held Henry's, Henry's hand and whispered in his ears those words. I left Henry's side and traveled to my next appointment. And only a few miles down the road, Roger called me and said, Henry has passed. And I thought, how appropriate with Jesus' words ringing in his ear and the promise that his heart was, light, was right with Jesus. Friend, the invitation went forth to Henry, and it comes forth to you as well today, to make things right between your Creator and life giver, Jesus Christ. That one day soon, whether you like flying or not, you'll be over any of that fear. We might all, day, we might all go soaring with him in heaven. This would be my wish and my prayer. And may we make that commitment as we hear our closing song when we all get to heaven. We'll sing it as a congregation when we all get to heaven. In front of you is a church hymn now, 633. Shall we all stand, please? 633. Sing the one true love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions, right and blessed, help prepare for us a place. When we all
as we're all standing, let's have closing prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to see Henry as he really was, from his life accomplishments to his accomplishment as a family man to the family he raised, and to see the influence that one person can have. We ask now for your special blessing upon each of us as we go our separate ways, as we spend time communing with each other at the meal afterwards, that we will do all to your glory. And that good memories will be had for everyone and prepare us for that time on, the, on that last day. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Just one or two items. On behalf of the Combs family, we thank you for the uh, love and support and your many kind acts and friendship with Henry and Enda through the many decades. They're greatly appreciated. We're going to ask, um, uh, I'll be dismissing the immediate family first, and they will, um, they will go to our Christian Life Center, which is just on the diagonal. It's air conditioned there, you can greet the family there. If you can stay for a light repast, uh, there'll be some served. So you'll greet, uh, you'll greet the family. They'll be just inside the double doors. Um, and then if you'd like to sit with your friends, be seated at a table and we'll dismiss the tables um, accordingly. So let's uh, let the family go first and then you can greet them following the service. Thank you so much for blessing us with your presence.